Welcome to episode 159 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Wayne Manis, who served in the FBI for more than 28 years. In this episode, he reviews his investigation of The Order, a white supremacist terrorist group, also known as the Silent Brotherhood, that operated in the Pacific Northwest in the early to mid-1980s. The pursuit of these terrorists consumed five years of Wayne Manis's career as he tracked their assassinations, armored car robberies, bombings, and counterfeiting activities. The hunt came to an end when Wayne and other SWAT team agents surrounded the terrorist on a remote Washington state island and killed the leader in a fiery machine gun battle. At the time, this was the nation's largest domestic terrorism case prior to Oklahoma City bombing. During Wayne's FBI career, he spearheaded the FBI's undercover program. While working undercover, Wayne penetrated the violent factions of the New Left in Chicago, posed as a hitman in a mob-related murder-for-hire case, and infiltrated the notorious criminal empire of the New Orleans crime family. Wayne also served as a team leader on the elite FBI SWAT team and was engaged in several deadly shootouts while serving in this capacity. With historical implications that still reverberate into present-day events, Wayne's career and casework are chronicled in his memoir, The Street Agent. Wayne Manis has been featured on true crime TV series, including The FBI Files. He's been a commentator on CNN, and he also speaks on domestic terrorism throughout the country and Canada. Since his retirement, he has owned and operated Manis Investigations, a company specializing in corporate security and executive protection. You can visit his website, thestreetagent.com, to learn more about Wayne Manis. I was absolutely thrilled to get Wayne to do this interview. I learned so much about the order. As a matter of fact, you know that remote island off of Washington State I just mentioned? Well, that's Whidbey Island, and my son actually just moved there. And I will be there probably next month or the following because his girlfriend is having a baby, and I will be out there to visit my second grandchild. While I'm on the island, maybe I'll be able to check out if and how that gun battle was remembered. I think that would be cool. But before we get to the interview, I just want to say thank you to those of you who reached out on social media to send me birthday wishes. Yes, Monday, March the 25th was my birthday. Actually, there was good news and bad news about that. The good news is that I am now old enough to start receiving my second pension check. Thank you, SEPTA. But the bad news is that I'm now old enough to start receiving my second pension check. So <laughs> I guess the alternative is unacceptable to me. So I guess let the birthdays keep coming. I actually used my birthday as an opportunity to give myself permission to take a break. I did nothing all day Sunday and most of the day Monday. I've been so busy finishing my next book, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a Manual for Armchair Detectives. I sent it off to headquarters for the pre-publication review. I have some agents reading it now to make sure I've covered everything that needs to be covered. The next few months, I'll be busy with copy editors and proofreaders and advanced reader teams to make sure that it's ready to go out to the world in June. I am so excited about FBI Myths and Misconceptions. 
In each chapter, I discuss one of my top 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and provide a reality check while breaking down the facts. Throughout the book, I use quotes from some of the retired agents about how the real FBI works. I also review popular films and fiction featuring FBI agent characters. While you're waiting for the book to be published, why not join my reader team and get the FBI reality checklist to discover the top 20 FBI myths and misconceptions. You can join my reader team at jerrywilliams.com or if you're listening on a podcast app that supports links, you can join in the description of this episode. Thank you. Now here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest, Wayne Mammis. Hey, Wayne, how are you? Hey, doing great, Jerry. Thank you. Well, I am so glad that I have you. Now, you're on the phone, and we laughed a lot. Uh, You told me that you were not a computer guy, and so we arranged for you to call in, but I think it sounds okay. Good. So, I have to give producer credit to a listener, Mike Jortzberg. He saw you on the CNN show Declassified, Untold Stories of American Spies, and he sent me an email and he said, hey, do you think you can get this guy, this retired agent, Wayne Manison, to talk about the order? And so I sent you an email, and here we are. <laughs> yeah, you never know. That was, I remember that program. It was, it was one of many I've done, but I think perhaps one of the best produced, you know. Yeah, so you've been on FBI, The Untold Stories. You've been on Turning Point, uh, produced by ABC. You've been on the Discovery Channel's Angry America. And, of course, you've been on the FBI Files. And you're on uh, various news shows on domestic terrorism. So I am very proud to have you on FBI Retired Case File Review. You can, you can, add, that to your, uh, <laughs> you can add that to your bio. <laughs> I will for sure. All right. You wrote a book about five years back called The Street Agent, and it is full of tales about your FBI career. Yes, I did. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that book after we've done this case review. But of all the cases that you've done, and you've done many, but I think this one for most people would be something different because For instance, recently when the Charlottesville incident occurred in 2017, many people had kind of forgotten about white supremacist groups. I mean, they know about the KKK, they know about Aryan Nation, but they had been keeping like a low profile. And then all of a sudden, you see this video on the news channels of white supremacists marching in the street, chanting hate and racism. And so your case, even though it goes back to the mid 80s, the mid 1980s, is still pertinent today. Would you like to introduce the case and set the scene for us? Yeah, sure, Jerry. I'd, I'd like to do that. I, I think you sort of uh, summed up the, the, uh, the importance of this particular case, uh, the, the significance of it, not only during that time period, but it's really extended into the current events of today. But uh, this group that we're going to talk about, they were known as The Order. They were unlike any group I'd ever encountered before. And I'd worked a radical right-wing type domestic Ku Klux Klan and such as that. When I encountered this group of people, they were truly different and presented a huge challenge. This group of of, uh, terrorists located in the uh, Western region of the United States were ruthless white separatists that you know, they embraced as their goal to kill and thereby remove all Jews from the United States. And ultimately, they intended to create so many acts of uh, terrorism and acts of violence that ultimately, you know, they'd be able to intimidate Congress to meet their demands, one of which was that five Western states be turned over completely to them and would be the basis of forming their first all-white Aryan nation. So that kind of tells you uh, on the face of it to be ridiculous, but as you, as you begin to get introduced into this group, you can see the, how dedicated, committed they were to these uh, principles that they had and to their 
mandate to do these things I just mentioned. You know, the order, it was primarily a politically based organization, but it, it, it had a, a religious basis as well. And that's really because of their affiliation with this group called the Aryan Nations. When you say religious basis, what religion? I mean, because that is gut churning for me to connect religion with hate. Ah, uh, yes, I understand uh, exactly what you're saying. You can't understand this organization, the order, if you don't understand both the political and the and their religious uh, affiliation to the to the Aryan nations. Seven of their members came from the from the Aryan nations, but they had they had people that came in from the Ku Klux Klan. They had the people that came in from um, many other uh, organizations with similar political beliefs. This all boils down to uh, uh, to a guy named Richard Butler who came. He was born in 1918 in the, in the military during World War II, and he came to, from California out to Idaho. I think it was about 1974, and he formed something called the Church of Jesus Christ Christian. Now, people in Idaho, you know, out here, they nobody paid much attention to Richard because he's just another preacher and another church coming in. There really wasn't because his church, the Church of Jesus Christ Christian, was had the philosophy called identity. Identity goes way back in the 1800s over in uh, Britain. But basically, identity says that the Jewish people that you and I would recognize as Jews in the world today, their belief was that, that these people are not true Israelites, that they are the seed of Satan. And rather than, than them falling into the professed title of children of Israel, they believe that the Caucasians of today are those true Israelites. And, I mean, they, they, they go on to explain their philosophy that, that uh, Moses, Moses, Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, are these names that, you know, that I recognize as being uh, uh, from, recognized from biblical history. That when these people that, that were part of the ten tribes of uh, Israel, when they passed over the Caucasus Mountains in search of the Promised Land, they picked up the name Caucasian, and 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 they go on to identify that one tribe settles Finland, one tribe Dan settles Denmark, and Judah goes to Germany. Joseph's two sons, one of them establishes Great Britain, the other one uh, in. in descendants come to America, which they say is the promised land. So if you don't understand that, you can't understand why these people are so dedicated and committed to their political agenda, the order I'm speaking of. And that's exactly what it was. Now, the order... Can you relate that to ISIS and Al-Qaeda? Because I think you can say the same thing about those groups. I've thought that many times. And you and I both know that the that the most dedicated, most committed uh, people throughout history in terms of warfare have always had some religious basis uh, to their um, uh, to their um, uh, commitment, their, their cause, you know? And we see that today. I'm glad you mentioned that. I've thought of that many times. But as we talk about the, uh, the order... This is a group of people, some of which shared the identity philosophy, some didn't, but most did. And they, uh, they felt it was a mandate, that they, it was necessary that they kill Jews to remove them from our, our uh, communities in the United States, that they subserviate other uh, minorities in America, basically to return America to an all-white Caucasian area nation. It couldn't have happened without a really strong leader, but they had, they had such a man. It was a young man named Robert Matthews, and Matthews was truly committed to this, to this belief and philosophy. Then he read a book called The Turner Diaries, which was written by a guy named William Pierce. And Turner Diaries is nothing more than a fictional story of a group like The Order. In fact, they called themselves in the book The Order. And this group of people, began to commit acts of terrorism, and they grow and grow until finally 
They take over FBI headquarters and they are able to intimidate Congress and create a new world order. You know, Matthews read this and he said, this is exactly who I am. This is exactly what I want to do. This is, this became his Bible. Well, ultimately, uh, that was a big help to me because I, I read his Bible too. Um, it, it helped a great deal once I became involved in the investigation of this group. But, you know, I, I think about how unlikely it was. Matthews, when he, when he committed himself to, the, to do these things, he recruited members from like-minded organizations, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, there was the Covenant Sword and Arm of the Lord located in Missouri. There was a Ku Klux Klan. And people came in from all over the country, from Pennsylvania to California, and joined his group. And most of these people were just like you and me. They just, uh, they were, they were, you know, they were ordinary, hardworking people. Some of them had military service records. Some worked for the post office. Some of them, um, you know, worked in other just ordinary uh, lines of work. They weren't criminals. Uh, they lived good lives, and with the exception of one, he, he had one one very significant criminal member who had just gotten out of prison, in fact, and he was a significant member of the group, but he didn't really teach the group anything about criminal activity. That, that kind of all came uh, like learning how to tie uh, tie your shoelaces. It was. It was something that they had to do again and again, and they had to get better at it and better at it. That's kind of the way they started off. But eventually, if you looked at this group, you'd take them very lightly. But it didn't take, it didn't take long until you, if you're an FBI agent, you begin to recognize that something's going on. Uh, that's kind of what happened with us. We had smoke, but we couldn't find the fire. The uh, group of the Aryan Nations, which was suspected, might be involved in some criminal activity, but that certainly couldn't be proved, and we'd never heard of the order. We didn't know about the separate group, but it, it was decided that the FBI needs to take a look at this group. I did want to bring up the fact that the reason you were so careful about that is because the FBI recognizes freedom of speech. So just because somebody is saying and spewing hate, you know, what they're going to do and what they want to do, they're allowed to do that. Oh, absolutely. There was a case called Sispies that sort of exa- sort of brought that uh, very issue to light. We just, you know, the public doesn't realize it, but the FBI doesn't doesn't investigate domestic uh, groups. The, there has to be enough probability there that there's criminal activity that you can get permission through the attorney general to conduct such an investigation. I had just finished up a. Uh, a, a very big, significant case on the Ku Klux Klan in Alabama. We'd arrested 21 Klansmen. It was kind of on the heels of that that I, I was requested to um, conduct uh, an examination of this group, the Aryan Nations, to see if there was any criminality involved as a part of the organization or be on behalf of the organization. So the year was 1984. And I left Alabama and I came to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Beautiful, beautiful place, a wonderful place, wonderful community. And when I arrived here, I realized this was a, this was the headquarters for the Aryan Nation. And the reason it was is because when this guy Richard Butler came out from California, he loved this place. He loved it really for all the wrong reasons. It's a, it's a beautiful place, great community, nice people. It's predominantly an all-white area. There are very few minorities here. Yeah, I guess that's why he loved it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's and, exactly why. And he, and he assessed that, of course. And why were you transferred there? Because it is a strange place, especially somebody who had had the success in their career that you were having. Um, how did you end up there? You know, we all have OP list, right? Office of Preference list? Yes. My Office of Preference had always been Butte, Montana, because I love the outdoors. I like to hunt, fish. I like that kind of life. You know, I have horses, and it's always been a rancher, and that was just my life. And I thought if I could get to Butte, that'd be great. And I had this experience, this domestic terrorism experience, both on the left and the right, 
and had just finished this Ku Klux Klan case, I, I was a likely candidate. So um, that's that's how that came about, Jerry. Well, that's interesting. I, I guess when yeah. I think about the work that you also did with the mafia, I, it, it it kind of seemed strange to me. But now, but now I understand. I, uh, I walked a lot of different uh, paths in the FBI. I had a lot of, a lot of diversified uh, cases and. I'm very fortunate in that regard. I don't know why that happened, Jerry, but it's just, it's, you know, it's just like, uh, it's just uh, the way my career broke. And that's just the way it was. I, uh, you know, uh, of all the cases I worked, though, this was a career case. You know what that means coming from the FBI, a career case. How many agents get the opportunity to have a career case? Not many. You're really fortunate if you get a career case, a case that means something that's going to take a long time, it's very complex, very complicated, very dangerous. That type of case uh, is hard to come by. And that's the way the order was. I can say that it was hard for me. It was a lonely time. I had to leave my family, and I was just working seven days a week. It was it was tough. But not as tough for me as it was for this guy named Matthews, because here's a guy who is starting a terrorist organization from scratch and doesn't have a clue. He brings in all these people. I hope you don't, I'm going back to this kind of this, this guy of just trying to develop this organization, you know, for you and your audience. But this guy reached out and he gets about 23 committed followers. And I mean, these were dedicated people. These are people who had 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 normal lives and now suddenly for their cause, for their belief, they are reaching out and putting their life and their futures on the line. And how many people would do that? When you think about it. And uh, yeah, to to me, I find that so so very unlikely uh, to happen. And to Matthews. To have these people come in and and uh, dedicate themselves to this cause, he believed it was prophetic, and uh, they were under the hand of God, and that uh, they couldn't fail. So he has this dedicated force of people. Their job is, as they see it, is to, through their actions, deliver the United States from Jewish influence, corruption, and usury, as they explained it to an all white. Christian organization that could be called the Aryan world, a world with a new political agenda. They, they commenced these acts, they said they would. I mean, it's the most incredible crime spree that you ever, ever recognized by a group. I mean, I should uh, relate to you. You'd be amazed at their uh, degree of criminal activity. I mean, I came out to Coeur It's 1984. February 1984. Now, this group has already commenced their criminal activities in 1983, but we're just we're just hearing rumors. And I had to, when I got there in 1984, I had to unravel these rumors and find out if any of them truly related to this group. Uh, so I, I was searching for all criminal activities in uh, Idaho, Montana, Washington, and trying to see if I could relate these to likely to any of these groups. Could you tell us about some of those activities and the purpose of these criminal activities they, they were involved in? Sure. I, can, I would be happy to do that. You know, I, I called in Richard Butler and I interviewed him. I kind of took his temperature and just wanted to find out what's this guy all about, you know. And I, was, I did that in the first couple of weeks I was here. I learned all, that's where I learned all about the Aryan nation. I still didn't know anything about the order. It's very common in an investigation. You start off trying to build a history. You got to learn about your enemy. You got to figure out if he's truly your enemy or is he just running around with people that are really your enemy. I found people uh, associated with uh, the Church of Jesus Christ Christian and and affiliated with the, those that were affiliated with the Aryan nations were walking a tightrope. You know, we go back to that issue you mentioned, Jerry, about um, being able to uh, conduct a really a full-scale investigation on a domestic group. All I could do was work around the edges because 
I didn't have the attorney general's authority to do a full scale investigation. Within by June, February to June, by June, I had submitted a report to the FBI to be presented to the attorney general justifying that full scale investigation. Until I got that authority, there was only so much I could do. But I got that authority in about um, July 1984. And once I did, I started developing informants, putting informants inside this group. And my whole world opened up. And it was only a matter of time until I discovered the existence of the order and how it related to the Aryan nation and and, uh, and what their intended purpose was. And I, and I was able to establish uh, membership names. I was overwhelmed. The Bureau realized I was overwhelmed. So they sent me, they sent me five guys out to help temporary bases. And then eventually those people left. I got five more people from San Francisco and then uh, seven or eight people from LA. And then people came in from Colorado and Florida. And you know how the FBI works. It's an amazing machine. When it, when it cranks up, uh, you better get out of the way because it's going to, it's going to move down the track pretty fast and nothing's going to stop it. So it wasn't like I had a, I had about 47 agents working with me out here in Coeur d'Alene and in Boise, across the strip from Coeur d'Alene to Boise. Probably as many as 200 people following leads throughout the United States. For people who are listening, leads are developed questions that need answers. And those leads, if it happens to be in Philadelphia, you send out a lead. It gets covered by an agent in Philadelphia. If it's in Alaska, you got somebody in Anchorage that's going to cover that for you. Feeds things up. You don't have to get on a plane, fly around to ask questions. Well, we were developing about 700 leads a week. So this was a, this was a busy time. In fact, at this point in time, this became the number one case in the FBI. The director had to be briefed on it uh, daily. We were busy, and I just uh, was beginning to realize that we were always playing catch-up because all the time we were trying to develop this information, build our task force, and get things going. They hadn't stopped. Bob Matthews and his group of warriors, they were on a roll. The first thing they were going to do is they had to get money. They knew they needed millions to recruit and sustain these people who had left their homes and were with him on a 24-hour day basis. So he commences his string of criminality. When he gets the money, he starts to build the core that he needs to sustain this group as, uh, as an army. He acquires state-of-the-art weapons and explosives. Um, he, he, he develops a fleet of vehicles and computers and police scanners, electronic voice detectors where he can test these people coming in to see if they're honest during their interview or if they're, if they're being uh, deceptive, you know. Uh, he developed safe houses across the United States and training camps. He's got centers for survivalist gear and food stock. They, do, they even developed a, a 50 caliber, they got a 50 caliber machine gun, the most feared weapon. If you're a Marine, the weapon you consider the most awesome weapon is that 50 cal. And then they, they got 50 gallons of uh, cyanide that they were, they were going to dump into a portion of the LA water system. But all these things to gain attention because their revolution, revolution was in full swing. And you asked me about some of the things they did. Yeah, you as a former FBI agent, you, you know that there are those times when uh, you're so overwhelmed, you know, you can't. One day blends into the next. You can't, you just can't hardly seem to get caught up. And that's the way I was with this group because before I got there, like in September of 1983, they were counterfeiting money and they were beginning to uh, develop the, the need to acquire false identities. And in December 1983, before I ever got out there, they did their first bank robbery in Seattle. Now, just a month before I got there, they did their second bank robbery in Spokane. And I had just arrived in February, and in March, they did their first armored car robbery in Seattle. And that was the first criminal activity 
that I traced to what I mistakenly was calling the Aryan nations because they came from the Aryan nations. The Aryan nations certainly had a degree of knowledge of the order and what they were doing, which made our investigation of a of a uh, of this type of organization legal for us to pursue, authorized to pursue the Aryan nations. But we're really now starting to get into what's known as the order. So here we go. I, I, am, I arrived in February, and in March, they hit their first armored car robbery. I know it's them. I'm sure of it, but I can't, I can't prove it. And then in April, just a month later, they bomb a porno theater in Seattle as a diversion to their next armored car robbery, which takes place the following day on April the 23rd. So they hit this armored car robbery, and it's their second one. And they, and then this time they get away with a half million. So that was a good hit. Later that same month, they bomb a Jewish synagogue. And in June, just uh, two months later, they commit their first murder. They murdered a, a, a guy that they felt was an informant for the FBI and knew too much about the counterfeiting that had taken place. The guy's name was Walter West. They, they murdered him, a uh, brutal murder, and then they buried him, and I've searched for him ever since, never been able to find him. Was he cooperating? Uh, Can you tell us that? Uh, he was not. He was not. He was a guy that, that overextended his, his exuberance was, was uh, too much for the group. He was present, he observed the counterfeiting, and then he wanted to join Matthew's inner group. And they became so convinced that he was a dangerous element. If he wasn't an informant, he would be. And they decided he had to go, so they killed him. And in that same month, they commit their second murder, and they put a lot of effort and surveillance in, into this one because this was a prominent Jew who resided in Denver, Colorado, and had a radio show with a, uh, with a huge audience. His name was Alan Berg. And they hated Alan Berg because he hated, he hated and with professed uh, and embarrassed people who had a, an anti-Jew philosophy. He would just skewer them on this radio show. They became aware of him and he said, let's just go kill that Jew. Let's get rid of him. And you know, they did. They shot him down, and he stepped out of his car in front of his residence. You know, they, um, they shot him. They hit him 12 times with a machine gun, and then uh, the gun jammed on the 13th round, and they believed that was a symbol of the 13 states. And it was just, um, excuse me, they shot him 13 times. It jammed on the 14th, and they believed that was, the, uh, that was a symbol as to the fact that they were on the right path and they had to continue on. Uh, and they always looked for these, these, these uh, symbolisms like that, you know? The very next month in July, they do another armored car robbery. And this armored car robbery is, uh, is, is highly successful to them because they get away with $3.6 million, but very significant for us because they left behind some traceable items, starting with a handgun that was dropped inside the the uh, Brinks uh, armored car when they were emptying out the cash and throwing it out the back door, a gun was dropped and we traced that gun. And that was a great, uh, a great lead for us. You know, that, that led us down the road, uh, a road to, to new trails that we hadn't even imagined existed before. Yeah. Why was that? I can't imagine that the gun was registered or was it? It was, it was a member of his group, a very significant member of his group had, bought that gun and he didn't have a a credit card he could buy it under he didn't have a false identity he he paid cash for it and he bought it under his true name because you know how it is you buy a handgun today you got to have identification uh you can't just walk in and buy a gun if you don't have a driver's license you can't prove identification well all he had at that time matthews had not started his uh his uh, alias program so the guy bought it under his true name, not believing it would ever be uh, recognized 
of trace to him, never be out of his possession. But he learned it to Matthews, and Matthews had it in his waistband that fell out. We took that, we traced it, and found the guy that Andy Barnhill, who uh, it was, it was uh, registered to. And from there, we traced, we got records on Andy Barnhill. We found where he had been uh, arrested uh, soliciting a, a prostitute, and with him was another guy named Evans. We ran Evans, and we saw his connections. Other people, all of them were in Matthews' group. And it was just an incredible piece of luck getting that, that firearm. But going back to this, uh, you, you see how this is happening every month or twice a month? I mean, we got armored car robberies, bank robberies, armored car assassinations. And we had that uh, that armored car robbery that did the, produce the $3.6 million. That was in July. I'd just gotten, by that time, just gotten my full authorization to uh, conduct a, a full-scale investigation on this domestic group. And so I got this Ukiah robbery. We all know it's them now. we got enough intelligence information to know this is them. we got agents on that all, all over San Francisco and up, going up to the Ukiah area. They're, they're dumping information off pay phones. They're getting registrations at motels. And we're setting leads off on all this information. And we're hitting pay dirt. Because all these guys that were involved in that armored car robbery were staying in two separate motels up at Ukiah under aliases. They were going to nearby pay phones to make calls to their families and others. When we dumped all the information off those telephones, here come the hot leads. And we're identifying not only other people in the, in the order, but where they're located. Where they're hanging out, who their who their uh, wives are, great information. We move on to the next month in October of '84. We have our first assault on uh, FBI agents. When the one guy I told you about had a criminal record, we were surveilling his place, and he opens fire on the FBI agents. Instead of responding to that, we decided now we know we know he's here and. Let's just not, let's just disappear. Let's keep an eye on this guy. Let's keep him under surveillance 24 hours a day. And that's what we did. We could have gone in and just arrested the guy for firing, for shooting uh, at uh, our agents who were driving by in a truck uh, nearby his residence, which was a remote place. But the next month, in November of 84, we once again come, we decide it's time to move in on uh, Matthews and his cohorts, and we are involved in a second uh, shooting incident, and in, that was in uh, Portland. And this shooting incident, we had one agent was shot, and Matthews was wounded, but he escaped, and we capture his his cohort, who's the guy I told you about with the criminal history. So we capture him, but. Uh, Matthews is wounded. He escapes. We got one agent down. The hunt is on for Matthews. Uh, a massive hunt is on for this guy now. And uh, through our informant information, one thing and another, we're able to trace Matthews to a remote hideout in Whidbey Island. We plan a, an assault. I was a member of one of the SWAT teams. We had five SWAT teams there. And we move in on, we had three different uh, locations. One, the place that Matthew was in, another place where another group of his terrorists were located. Uh, that was the counterfeiters, professional counterfeiters and ex-cons that uh, had joined in the group uh, later on. And then we had another place where another one of his cohorts was located. So that's three different places we have to solve all at the same time, right at the break of dawn one morning. And we do. The location where the counterfeiters were located, that one went down okay. It took a couple of hours, but there was no violence there. The other one, the guy tried to escape. Uh, we had a gun. He had a gun in each hand. He ran right into a, a fortified SWAT team. So he threw his guns down and he, su he submitted to arrest. But Matthews was in this hideout with another guy, and he wouldn't surrender. Uh, one thing led to another. He released his other cohort that was with him inside the place. We knew we just had Matthews. There was no longer any type of, um, of uh, pressure on us 
that we might be dealing with one good guy and one bad guy. We had one guy in there, and he was a bad guy, and that was Matthews. We tried to negotiate him out. He wouldn't come out, and so me and it was about five five other guys made an assault on the place. We got engaged in a machine gun battle with him, and we were really fortunate nobody got wounded or killed in that engagement because a lot of rounds were fired. I took, you know, seven, eight, nine rounds, ten rounds, I don't know, right through the wall over my head. And I just recognized at that time, this isn't going to end well. And uh, I want to talk to this guy, and he's not giving up. Uh, we had five of his cohorts in custody. We brought them down to try to negotiate with him. They spoke over the loudspeakers to him, told him they, they'd been arrested and they weren't being harmed and he should give up. And his response to that was, you know, he was never giving up. We engaged Matthews in another firefight after dark. He, he commences it. We don't, but we got him surrounded. He opens fire on us. And once again, he's firing with automatic weapons in the night. And I emptied an, M- an MPK into his, uh, into the muzzle flash because he was shooting directly in my direction. And I didn't know if I'd hit him or not, but then he opens up on the other side on the LA team and they, they opened up and it sounded like the, from the last scene of the movie, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid when they met their device. I knew this was, this was going to be bad when I saw the cabin catch fire from a flare that we'd fired to light up the inside of the cabin. And it did. He continued fighting and then uh, firing through the various windows, and then his firing silenced, and then we heard multiple rounds of ammunition cooking off inside the house, and ultimately the house burned it to the ground. I walked up at daylight, and I stood there looking at this rubble on the ground, and I see Matthew's body uh, lying in a, in a bathtub that had fallen to the ground near the edge of the house. Uh, we had you now five members and one dead. And we had to round up the rest of these guys that were in the wind. Congress by this time had received a letter that all these people signed saying that they were declaring war against Congress and they would find them one and all and hang them by the neck. So the guys that were now in the wind, we had to do an extensive investigation to locate them because, as, you know, as you can imagine, with Matthews being killed and the others in custody, they're going to, these others are going, people are going to be accelerating their activities and we need to catch up with them as fast as we can. And sure enough, we were right because in April of that year, one of the members kills a Missouri state trooper and he wounds another trooper. And by August of that year, we were commencing a trial because we had managed to arrest more than 90% of all, of all the terrorists. Then they came forth with an attempted assassination of one of our chief witnesses. You know, I felt by this time we were on top of the case. Uh, we were going to be successful. We had tons of evidence. And I was correct. With the exception of a, just a couple of people that we hadn't been able to locate, we we're going to have to hold separate trials for them. And we did find them, and we did hold those trials. Everybody, everybody was convicted. Everybody got heavy sentences. Most of those people are, they're either, some have been released out into the, into our society, but not many. Most of them died in prison or they're still in prison. Some of them received sentences of like a, a hundred years. And they weren't pardonable. There was an event that happened. It's like it wouldn't die. We're being very successful. We got these people convicted. And right on the heels of this, some of the people who were aware of our investigation that were also dedicated to this cause, they come forth. The crime starts all over again. They commence in, in February 1986. They're counterfeiting money. In June, they're starting to bomb uh, places. They do their first bombing in June. In August, they do another bombing. Uh, later in August, they murder a guy named Kenneth Shray, who showed up with a manuscript that he was doing a fictional story of the order. They believed he was an, an informant of mine. Uh, they had meetings about it. And they said, this guy's got to be working for Wayne Manison. We got to get rid of him. So they assassinated him. 
can see the things are happening all over again. By September, the next month, they bomb another place. It's the residence of a Catholic priest who is prominent in the community. He's the head of the human rights, uh, and he's a, he was a diversity-oriented spokesman for the community, and they hated him. So they bombed his place, and it's just a miracle they didn't hurt him badly because we had metal fragments that went all through his house. The next month in September, they bombed the federal building where my office is located. And right on the heels of that, they do two other bombings in the community. They bomb a, a National Guard armory, and they bomb the place where the recruiting office. What kind of damage was done at the federal building? Um, not much, but they had staked this out closely. They knew that, as which is common with FBI agents, you show up in the morning, you get your, your day organized. About 9 o'clock, you're leaving the office, and we were pretty regular on it. So they had surveilled us. They knew that we generally walked out of the federal building about 9 o'clock. They put a timer bomb right at the front steps. And we had left about five minutes early that day, and just passed there, and the bomb goes off. And uh, uh, it really ticked us off, because we realized that not only were we following them, they were following us. They were keeping an eye on us, you know? So we went into full court press on these guys. We located them. We got the evidence on them. Uh, we arrested them and convicted him. But to me, I recognize that not only did I have the first group, but I got the second group. And you'll remember Timothy McVeigh that bombed the federal building. Uh, oh, uh, how could I forget in him? In Oklahoma. Yeah. Well, he was a follower of this group. He was a guy that went to the Aryan Nation compound, uh, read the Turner Diaries, studied what the order had done. And here we got him doing this terrible, uh, destructive act at the Oklahoma uh, City Federal Building. So it's like it doesn't end, you know? The, the people that followed Matthews, they're in prison, they're dead. But the way I look at it, the way I see it, and what I've learned over the years is that there's other people out there of the same yoke, the same belief in our country. And these people, I mean, all it takes is a spark to ignite the flame that will produce order number three. Yeah, and that's I, right. I noticed something you said earlier. Yeah. You mentioned earlier this, you know, how this relates to today, and it does. I would think that the reason that Matthews sent that guy out of the house is that he had full intention of becoming a martyr. Has he become a martyr? Is he looked at from people who share his ideology of somebody who, you know, made the ultimate sacrifice for the order for white supremacy. You're absolutely correct. And that is, that is true. And he's looked upon with an air of reverence. I remember a prominent member said, we'd all have to stand on Bob's shoulders to be able to commence anything similar to what he did. And the reference is just amazing. You just, I, when I think back, on it, I'm just startled and amazed that this great uh, machine called the FBI was able to come from so far behind and catch up and surpass and stop this group from doing the things that they were planning on doing. You, you think about it, in that short period of time, look what they accomplished. Look at the money they got. Look at the assassinations they made. Their plan, they had informants inside Brink's headquarters. Informants. After that armored car robbery, their plan was within two weeks to rob Brink's headquarters. And they had every place in, everything in place to do it. The only reason they got stopped is because we created hell for them uh, on the heels of that armored car robbery at Ukiah. But we arrested the people that they had, uh, that had helped them plan the Brinks robbery in, uh, San Francisco. Uh, we got them as well. But it would only been a, have been a matter of uh, weeks until they had, would have assassinating senators, congressmen, and other prominent uh, politicians that they believed to have Jewish affiliation or 
believed to be so liberally oriented that they would need to be assassinated. Unbelievable. And this is true. This is this is this is true crime. This is not crime fiction. Yeah, some mini series on Netflix. These are the real life warped thinking of Americans. People who call themselves are called themselves Americans. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you know, I always like to emphasize that there's there's no end to the capabilities of the Bureau. When that great machine starts moving, uh, you better get out of the way. We had one guy who said he was going to take this federal witness, have him assassinated, cut his head off because that was a biblical mandate, and he wanted his head shipped to the FBI. And this was on the commencement of the trial. He believed that would intimidate witnesses not to testify. Well, we got wind of that, and we sent an informant in to take the contract. And the guy takes the contract, and we... We pull our witness into the lab at FBI headquarters. We lay him on the floor. We, we have our people take photographs of him. We remove his head, roll it off to the side, and draw in the necessary uh, torn tissue, put the appropriate amount of blood down there, take a photograph of him, have the informant carry that back to the guy that ordered the hit. And we were in the next room watching the whole thing on television, and when the money's passed and the deal is done, we throw the door open and walk inside and arrest the guy. So just think about it. It took a lot of different things like this to break this group down. A lot of violence we had to encounter and a lot of surveillance and a lot of undercover stuff as well. A career case. Uh, I think you'd agree with me. It's uh, unlike any case you ever heard of. Oh, that's the truth. And again, when you talked about revving up the FBI machine, when you mentioned all of the agents, not just in, you know, where you were in, in Idaho, but around the country that, you know, came out and participated in this investigation, it's, it's pretty amazing. And something <laughs> that I don't know if a lot of people know about. Uh, you're right. How this escaped the uh, attention of uh, national attention, international attention. I don't know. I just don't know. We, um, we were the number one case of the Bureau. We had plenty of local coverage. I mean, it was like every night. The national news media just seemed like they didn't catch on to what was really going on. Amazing, huh? You think about it today, you think, well, it's not possible if that happened today. I would hope not, you know. I, I would hope not. Mm. But yeah, it's it's absolutely frightening. And so you 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 mentioned today. Do you believe, with the climate of the country now, do you believe there is a Matthews and the order and the Aryan nation, someplace growing stronger and stronger, and soon will be back into the same type of crime spree? that you were able to damp down? I know, I don't just believe, I know that the populace that shares this philosophy is there. The organizations are there. The only thing that's lacking, there's dedication right now, but there's no commitment. The only thing that's lacking is a Bob Matthews. One guy within uh, one of these organizations and start to consolidate people into a, a like-minded group. But there has to be that commitment. And it doesn't take that many people, as you, as you can see from the fact that Matthews had 23 dedicated people, and look what they did. Yes, I believe it can. I believe it will happen again. But it takes that rare charismatic leadership to push the stone over the mountain so it can start to roll. And that's what we're lacking, Jerry. And I'm thankful we're lacking it because uh, when this happens again, it's going to be extremely unpleasant for our society because Bob Matthews set the goalpost. And the moves he made that turned out to be a mistake approaching the goalpost are them are are a guidebook for the next people that follow things not to do 
and ways to rearrange your organization so it's not detectable or able to be destroyed because one or two or three people happen to get arrested. Covert cells and this sort of thing. All this is being discussed today within various organizations, but it's a rarity to find a man and a group of people who will say, okay, my life's on the line. My life as I've known it is over. This is one of the reasons uh, I think that there's still an interest within the Bureau and within other intelligence organizations in the United States because I think they do realize that there's a strong probability that we could have another order. And I've had so many people contact. I, You know, I can't believe I've been out of the FBI. I mean, uh, I left the FBI in 1994. And my life has been continuous FBI ever since. Uh, there's never a month that goes by that I'm not contacted by somebody relating to the thing that we did in relation to the order. There's other cases I worked on that still draw attention, and that amazes me. There's an effort underway right now by some by a prominent person who wants to make this a movie or a TV series. So you see uh, all the interest that still is there. And that's why I wrote the book that I wrote, because I had so many FBI agents that contacted me over the years and said, Wayne, you, you know, you had a magnificent career. You, you just got to write a book. And so, you know, after about 16 years after I left the FBI, I told one of my former cohorts, uh, Dave Jernigan, I said, he said, you've got to write that book. You've been promising you would for 16 years and you haven't done it. And I said, I'll do it. And I did. The book is called The Street, the Street Agent. And I, it, was, it was published in 2014 and still very active today. Your case review on the order and Matthews has been absolutely mesmerizing but we probably have only touched on the surface so i am so glad that you wrote your book the street agent so that we can all read it and really dig into some of the details i will have a link to the street agent on the show notes for this episode and i will also add it to my fbi reading resource which is a list of books about the fbi written by the very agents who've been on this podcast. Right now, there's over 50 books. Now, The Street Agent actually covers all of your career, and it has, and you talk about all of the cases. So why don't you tell us when you joined the FBI, and most importantly, why you joined the FBI? Well, Jerry, uh, that's pretty easy for me, because the time I, from the time I was a kid, I wanted to be an FBI agent. I saw the movie, The FBI Story, with uh, Jimmy Stewart, and I, I watched. I wanted to be a, I wanted to be an FBI agent. I wanted to be a Marine. Those were two things that were on my agenda, and I'm very fortunate because I got to do both of them. I saw John Wayne play Sergeant Stryker on the sands of Iwo Jima, and I thought, yeah, I, I, a Marine. I got to be a Marine, but I want to be an FBI agent too. So I joined the Marine Corps in 1962. And I entered the FBI in January of 1966. I was on the Marine Corps base, actually. I was the acting provost marshal for uh, the 2nd Land Battalion on the Force Troops Marine Corps. And an FBI agent would come in and conduct investigations, and I was the acting provost marshal, so we had that interaction. His name was Jake Clayton Taylor, and he was the image in my mind of an FBI agent. You know, he just had that look and well-dressed and... He recruited me into the FBI. I've maintained contact with him until today. You know, bless his heart. He's just as uh, exciting and interesting to talk to today as he was back then. But that's kind of how I came into the FBI. It was planned for many years, and I was just very fortunate that I was able to bring it together. Well, when you talk about somebody having the look of an FBI agent, you sent me this wonderful picture of you, you know, in the shooting stance. And I'm going to also put that with the episode show notes. But, you know, you had that FBI poster boy look, too. <laughs> uh, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. That's a compliment. Well, my next question, then, is... 
you know, and, and you touched on it a little bit, and that is, what are you doing now? I see that you're the owner and president of Manus Investigations. Could you tell us more about that? Yes, I started after I left the uh, I left the FBI in 1994. In the next couple of months, I started a private investigative business, as many agents do. And suddenly, uh, it began to to blossom, and it and it grew into a into a big organization. Within a couple of years, we were representing some of the largest corporations in America, and we kept it in that vein. I mean, we had a, a multi-million dollar organization with 70 plus FBI agents working, former FBI agents working for us. It was just a great deal. And for me, it was, uh, it was unexplainable, but I, I certainly felt fortunate to have the opportunity to continue to engage with all my former FBI associates and friends and keep them employed, you know, over the next decade. You know, eventually I got to a point where I just felt like it's time to slow down. So I, I brought that organization down to a more boutique type of operation and I, I've not regretted it. Uh, it's been fun keeping involved in the corporate world, investigatively speaking, and being able to keep in touch with the FBI through these years. I can only say that as of January of last year, I began to release clients to other FBI agents who were in, engaged in the business, repaying them for all the things they did for me over the years. I never wanted to sell the business. I wanted it to con- continue, but continue in the, with the direction of other people besides myself. And that's kind of where I am today. One of the things that you said, and you said this several minutes back, but when you were talking about the order, you use the word when this happens again, instead of if this happens again. And so I always let my guest have the last word. I would love for you to use your time to address why you used when instead of if. Well, you know, Jerry, having been through this experience and being so intimately involved with the enemy, understanding where they came from, understanding their philosophies, realizing how committed they were to accomplishing their goals, and knowing, absolutely knowing that those same types of people are together today within their various uh, organizations, little organizations, some bigger than others, spread throughout the United States, Pennsylvania, Michigan, New York, you name it, there's hardly a state you can name in the United States that doesn't have some sort of an affiliation to this type of thought. So the probability that there might be a charismatic leader come together in one of these groups and form an umbrella and to bring the other groups in and to once again commit to changing this country and bringing it back into the to the fold as they see it i i, I don't see how it's uh, how it's conceivable that this won't happen i don't know when but i believe when and that's the end of the interview at jerrywilliams.com you'll find a photo of wayne manis matter of fact there's several really great photos of him when he was arrested, when he was undercover, a mugshot photo. There's a photo of him serving a warrant on Aryan Nation members at their compound in Idaho. There's newspaper articles and videos about the order. And of course, there's a direct link to Wayne's book, The Street Agent. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them listen to the post on my website, how to listen to a podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or anywhere you listen to audio. Soon you'll be able to pick up a copy of my first nonfiction book, 
FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives. Coming soon to all stores where books are sold. It's a 55,000 word expanded version of my popular FBI reality checklist. If you enjoy police procedurals, I hope you also consider picking up copies of the crime novels in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. The crime fiction series features Special Agent Carrie Wheeler, Temptation, Corruption and Redemption. The books are available as ebooks and paperbacks at Amazon.com and Pay to Play is also an audiobook. I want to thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.